Clinker Factor, the cement industry podcast. Welcome to The Clinker Factor, a podcast from WCA, which looks at the cement industry's response to climate change around the world and other topics of interest. I'm Ian Riley, CEO of WCA, and your host on The Clinker Factor. Before we get started today, I want to draw your attention to the 2023 WCA Annual Conference, which will be held on October the 24th and the 25th at Emirates Towers in Dubai. Early bird tickets are available until August the 31st, and we still have a few exhibitors slots available. We'll put a registration link in the episode notes. Today I'm talking to Tom Mitchell, who is the Executive Director of IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. And IIED have been working for over 50 years on sustainable development issues, uh, mainly in the global south. Uh, so welcome, Tom. Uh, maybe we could start and you could introduce yourself and explain how you came to be in your current role, and then uh, a little bit about uh, IIED's background. Thank you, Ian. I'm delighted to uh, to join you today. So my personal pathway into this, uh, this agenda really has been through a world of think tanks. And think tanks really focused on this question of how are we going to support different countries around the world with tackling climate change, but also considering the whole range of other factors, including economic growth, protecting their people and so on. And, and so I've been a researcher, I've worked uh, with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and with UN agencies, and more latterly have been working in international policy processes to help figure out how best to move money around to build solidarity around these agendas. Um, and then I joined IIED about nine months ago. IIED is an organisation with a very big reputation when it comes to international climate negotiations, has for many years supported the least developed countries group, which is a group of 46 of the poorest countries in the world, raise their voice on the international stage. And so we, we support them with, with, with negotiator training, with helping build the evidence base and so on, and so that they get a fair deal when they come to uh, the big international negotiating tables. And then the organization uh, works all around the world, particularly with a focus on raising the voices of the community's hardest hit by the impacts of climate change or by biodiversity crisis and so on. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about today was the, uh, the loss and damage fund. And maybe we could start out just by explaining what that is, because from a cement industry standpoint, this is something that's come up at conferences in the last couple of years, but I, I don't think it's well understood at all. Well, let me just go back um, very briefly to 1992, when the UN set up the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that is the international agreement that effectively says all countries around the world need to work together on tackling the problem of climate change. And originally, back at that time, it pointed out that there are three major pillars of that. One is to reduce greenhouse gases. The second is to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And the third is to accept that there are some impacts that we're not going to be able to adapt to and that they're causing loss and damage. Effectively, losses of livelihoods, of housing, of infrastructure, of people's lives, or damage to that. So that's been as part of the UN Convention for an awful long time now, for the last 30 years. Now, rightly so, the efforts in the first decade or so of that process were around reducing greenhouse gases as fast as possible. Now, unfortunately, we weren't hugely successful with that. So then progressively in the second decade, there was more attention paid to, well, okay, how do we adapt to the impacts of climate change? Acknowledging that they're coming and we can understand those and we can prepare for those and so on. Now, as we've not necessarily done very well on that one either, there has been this progressive view that actually countries around the world and people around the world, particularly those on the front lines of the impacts of climate change, are experiencing loss and damage. And the argument being for every ton of carbon put into the atmosphere, the risks of loss and damage to be experienced by those people are, are increasing. And so the argument goes that we need an international mechanism that helps to support those people who are experiencing loss and damages because it's not their fault. It's not been their fault for the last decades. And there is a moral responsibility that we act in solidarity to help. Now, every time you see news, you know, you, you see on the news, uh, the latest flood or the latest drought, or we're experiencing at the moment, a lot of significant heat around the world, then those events do have negative impacts on those people least able to cope. And so it's very much now front and center of the agenda. And in Sharm El Sheikh at COP27, in uh, December last year, countries agreed to establish this loss and damage fund. And there's now a process leading up to COP27 
28 in Dubai in early December that says, okay, how's this fund actually going to work and who can access it and who, how much money's going into it and so on. So that's where we stand now. So I, I guess one of the things that as an industry we're interested in is how companies that are outside the developed world, I mean, in particular Europe, where you have a carbon price mechanism, which is becoming more and more relevant to the cement sector as the free allocations are, are phased out and, and we have CBAM replacing them as a, a trade defense mechanism, but cement companies will be buying more credits. And so that obviously is a mechanism that encourages decarbonization in ways that previously weren't economic. And of course, we have the IRA in, in the US, which is providing subsidies for projects such as uh, carbon capture and storage. But when, when we go beyond the developed world, if you are in Africa or India or Middle East, then today the economics are, are the same as they've always been. So there are some things that can be done to reduce the carbon footprint at the same time as reducing costs in terms of energy efficiency, fuel switching, and, and reducing the clinker factor. But it's still, you know, that same group of things that we, we've been doing for the last 20 years or so. Is there anything in the way in which the loss and damage fund will work that what might help to finance a decarbonization of the cement industry in the developing world? So the direct answer to your question is no, not under the loss and damage fund. So the loss and damage fund is being particularly positioned as a way of getting money to those people who've just experienced the negative impacts of a climate change event to effectively act as a compensatory mechanism, although we don't use the language of compensation in that regard. It's more a solidarity mechanism. And so that's not really targeting businesses at the moment. Having said that, there are plenty of other initiatives that are doing as you as you're saying, in the in the international negotiations many years ago, there was a commitment made by richer countries to be able to transfer money to poorer countries in order to help them with decarbonization and help them adapt to the impacts of climate change. And people listening may have heard in the past that that commitment was for 100 billion US dollars per year. Now, unfortunately, we've never quite met that target. And that's one of those um, places where there's quite a lot of bitterness within the negotiations. But that money, which I think we're now in the order of 80 or 90 billion is transferred to developing countries for different programs through various means of which you know, the Green Climate Fund is one example of the way that that money gets transferred. And that those projects are then to support industry or business to look at decarbonization and potentially to look at protecting themselves against the impacts of climate change. So we know that businesses around the world are also being impacted by floods and droughts and heat and so on, even if it's if it may just be directly on their operations, it can also be on their workforces, not being able to get to work and so on. So there are resources for those types of projects. Where there has also been a criticism is that the bureaucracy around accessing that money can be quite challenging. And so I think if you're a cement industry company in parts of Africa or in Asia looking for resources to help with decarbonization, then there are funds available to you, but you would need to put some time, resources, efforts and people into unlocking those. And that's been one of the bigger criticisms. I think there's a second Second consideration here, which is in Glasgow two years ago, when we had the COP in Glasgow hosted by the UK government, there was a big effort on behalf of financial institutions to come together. I don't know whether you recall Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, helped to pull together a set of financial institutions under a program called GFANS, which stands, I can never fully remember, but the, the, the Glasgow Finance uh, Alliance for Net Zero. And that, that group has been looking now to establish um, financing partnerships with different developing countries to support decarbonization and energy transition. Now, these are only really just getting started, but in terms of industry, looking at new things coming forward that may well be open to them for, for that support, then these, these are supporting these Just Energy Transition Partnerships, and JETPs is the acronym we use. There's one in South Africa, one in, one in Indonesia, and there are several others being considered. And I think that's another route that industry should look at, because in some ways, it's going to provide more flexible more significant money to this task, particularly in the absence of the type of carbon markets and regulation that you're talking about. Yeah, so we nearly 90% of uh, cement produced in the developing world, then clearly, if we're really going to make a difference, uh, it's very important that we spread the efforts, which, you know, to date have primarily been in, in the developed uh, countries, especially when it comes to carbon capture and storage, and the kind of large investments, and, uh, and also not just investments, but, um, you know, infrastructure frameworks that you need to make these happen. 
Um, so if we come back to the loss and damage fund, can you explain how it will work and, and what types of projects or what types of, of work would, would qualify under that? Yeah. Okay. So the agreement in, in Sharm El Sheikh was struck. Uh, it said that there would be a, a loss and damage fund established, but then there would also be the enhancement of a set of other funding arrangements. And so if we just take a step back and look at the international landscape here, we've got a set of kind of climate change related disasters happening around the world. And, you know, the, the nature of disasters is not new. We've had those, obviously, for uh, a, as long as time can remember, and that the world has tended to have a response to many of those. And we see them in appeals and in humanitarian action. And you see, of course, pictures on the television. And for many of your listeners, they will have experienced the reality of those. And so we have already an international system in place that helps to, to respond when that happens. Unfortunately, now, though, we're seeing the kind of pace of those disasters and those impacts accelerating quite significantly with the impacts of climate change. And so that system is not able to cope now with the scale of what's being experienced. And as I said before, you know, this can have a very direct impact on, on businesses and, and on your, you know, I'm sure on the, the, the companies that your listeners are engaged with. Now, what the loss and damage fund then is intended to do is to enhance that kind of existing response system in such a way at the moment where there is a time targeting towards those vulnerable developing countries, first and foremost, that have least resources to be able to deal with the problem, but also arguably have done least to contribute to the problem. So there's a targeting component to this fund. And that means Africa and then Asia and, and, and other parts of the developing world in particular will be a beneficiary. And then there's a second component here, which then talks about, well, where's the money coming from, of which there is a lot of design work going on at the moment. And under consideration there are contributions from governments that have been, you know, clearly part of the causing the problem. And then there's also now a discussion about, well, who else should be putting resources into the pot? And then there's discussion and therefore around some enhanced taxation. And the most, most high profile one recently has been talking about taxing on shipping, where the International Maritime Organization had a meeting a couple of weeks ago where this was considered. Or there's been talk about taxing air travel further or taxing the profits of fossil fuel companies and so on. There's another body of, of assessment, therefore, around contribution from taxation. And then people say, well, beyond that, let's look at the fact that, that there have been businesses over the last decades who've at least acknowledged that their emissions have contributed to climate change. And should there be a contribution made from those businesses, particularly those in the global north, who have benefited largely from the externalities in some ways that they've had through emissions and so on. So there's a very active debate at the moment about who puts the money in and at what scale this is. At the moment, they're not decided. That's part of what the arrangements are trying to be considered in Dubai. But in terms of the mechanism itself, there is a big push to avoid the bureaucracy that, that, that plagues many of the other international climate funds. And so many developing countries are pushing to say, well, actually, we need direct access to this fund. We need the money to be transferred directly into our coffers to focus on helping uh, us cope with the impacts of climate change. And let's not have that be projects. Let's have that be something where we put forward national plans and then you back our plans or national response mechanisms. So that's where the discussion is at the moment. There are groups of people sat around the table considering each of these factors now on a fairly intensive basis. And um, with the idea that in Dubai, there is a recommendation given to the kind of the ministers of the world that says, here's how we should set it up. Here's the mechanisms, here's the funding sources and so on. But as you can imagine, this is quite a political space because who pays and what's the distribution of that? And, and you know, which countries are stepping up to acknowledge their responsibilities is always a tough one. Um, and the US in particular, of course, quite worried about how much resource, how much money it might cost them if they had to uh, really put the, the kind of full weight of their responsibility behind this. I think there must also be a concern in terms of maintaining political support. I, I was thinking about what we've seen in the UK recently with some considerable questioning of whether we should be spending extra money to try and decarbonize energy, given that the UK is only responsible for you know less than 1% of of emission and and I think there's a there's a risk
risk, isn't there, that political support for the project as a whole uh, could be derailed if there's a perception that money that's being put into the loss and damage fund is being used improperly or unfairly. Yeah, you know, quite honestly, over the past 30 years, there have been, depending on which countries are around the table and what political flavour they have, have, have often waxed and waned. You know, we know under the Trump administration, they withdrew from the entire Paris Agreement, saying that the US didn't have political support for it. And they're now back in and so on. But many countries have been through journeys of more support and less support. I think what tends to endure is that this is, you know, the UNFCCC are legally combined, legally binding binding international uh, convention. It's now endured for 30 years, and it has been through a variety of ups and downs, and yet has continued to kind of build progress. Now, maddening, maddeningly slow from the perspective of some of those countries most impacted. But you, I think you're right in saying that the kind of political project here is one that is sensitive to those types of arguments. Now, my response to the point that you put forward was, if every country in the world thought that it was only responsible for X percentage, and their Therefore, threw its hands up and said, "What, well, whatever we do is not going to make a difference, then therein lies the problem. And so, you know, we do need an international solidarity around this. I think for those in the global north, if I was um, uh, thinking of it just from uh, a member of the public in a country like the UK or the US, we're starting to see the really negative effects on our own lives as well. So not in quite the same way that we see in parts of the developing world, but whether that's the impacts of climate change in our country, or indirectly through the prices of our food, for example, or disruption to some of our travel plans. Well, you know, the, there are international mechanisms here that really do mean that we're going to get exposed to these things. Now, if you're a right-wing government, as there are many in Europe, you're also worried about the impact on migration and the fact that there, if there are less livable parts of the world, then the extension goes is there's more people on the move, more people seeking to find safe places to live. And this we've seen in Europe is a, is a significant political issue. And I think in that regard, it's in our interests to be able to support a global global solidarity mechanism that means that actually we can do the best for everybody on the planet, acknowledging that really things are now changing fast. And I think that's going to require us to rethink a little bit, because um, if we're short-sighted, actually, it's only going to get worse uh, on, on many fronts. And so um, my argument would be, let's really press on here. And international cooperation is the best thing we can do now, acknowledging that it, there aren't, there's going to be pain for everybody. We've got to put the investment in now, rather than delay it. You know, we bury our heads and hope it's all OK, which it, I think it's clear it's not going to be. So if we, if we can overcome the, you know, the, the, the question of who puts the money in, what's the money going to be used for? Is there a particular type of project or what, what, what sort of activities are likely to qualify? So my organisation, um, IAD, has been um, hosting a, a global dialogue series with many of the communities that are on the front line of the impacts, asking this question of what are the practical things that we can do now that will actually help reduce loss and damage or help people cope. There are many, many things we can do. Let me take some examples. So in many countries around the world, we have uh, exposure to hurricanes and cyclones and so on. And we know that if you have a healthy coral reef, you have healthy mangroves, and you have healthy forest cover and land cover, then it reduces the impact of those events. And so we see around the world lots of projects that are about restoring or conserving land in such a way that it helps to enhance protection for people. So that would be one example. The second is we're seeing at the moment lots of extreme heat. And yet we've actually forgotten how to build and work with extreme heat, where in the past, a lot of places in hotter countries were painted white. They were made from um, local materials. The clouses were close together so you could um, get shading and so on. We forgot a lot of that. And actually now there's a big effort to say, well, actually, let's go back to doing some of those things that we know really helps. So that's another example. I think in terms of actually responding to the impacts, one of the big impacts that we're seeing at the moment is, is massive problems with mental health around the world. So the stress of the impacts of climate change. And so we need more mental health professionals who are actually going to be helping particularly children deal with these impacts. And at the moment, that's really missing. Let me pick one more, which is that we've got, um, you know, people will be familiar with social protection programs, or some people call it benefits or, you know, welfare programs. Are there ways in which in response to an early warning, so, you know, a drought is coming, can we get resources to people to help support their water management? And so that there can be more water sources to help deal with drought. Now, that's a project that is starting to happen in many places around the world, and you can enhance your payment 
investments to farmers, for example, to help manage their, their crops and soils better with some additional resources that protects them against destroyed yields and so on. So there's dozens and dozens of very practical things we can be doing. And the loss and damage fund will be spent on those types of activities. And what we need to ensure, though, is that the money does get to the communities on the front line. And that's not always a given because there's lots of intermediaries, lots of people take their cuts and so on. And so IID is pushing hard for a system that helps that money get to those people on the front line, which includes businesses. You know, and I think we need to acknowledge that businesses and uh, are disrupted and are a part of this mix as well. And so the job to do is to say, how do we protect all businesses and all people from these impacts now? But it's a tough job. The impacts are large. The distribution is significant. But if we don't get on the front foot with this, then we are going to see really dramatic effects over the coming decades. So uh, just going back to your second point there on the you know, the painting of the buildings uh, white and, and so forth, one of our climate partners is uh, the Smart Surfaces Coalition, and that's uh, an NGO based in the US. And they've developed uh, quite a lot of studies to show the impact that uh, the surfaces for roofs and roads can have. And they've got a, a number of projects in the US and India. But I think this is, um, it's really a very straightforward way of making a surprisingly large difference. And of course, also, um, hard surfaces uh, have an impact on flooding. And you know, the more of the more hard surfaces that you have, then the more likely you are to get the flash floods uh, in the cities. And uh, you also lose on on the uh, evaporative cooling. So I'd uh, be very happy to put you in touch with the Smart Surfaces Coalition if you think there's any uh, opportunity to work together there. Absolutely. I think that's a you know, and actually, more and more, we're realizing that there are not the most costly solutions. Actually, there are things that can be done with modest resources, with some training and support, with making sure materials are accessible. We can make a huge difference. As you said, that getting the surfaces right can, can be a difference between life and death for, for tens of thousands of people at the moment. And so, you know, the funding mechanisms that we're talking about here are for scaling exactly those type of solutions. And I would imagine that, uh, you know, when it comes to listeners here who are working on materials and are looking at supply chains and so on, bearing in mind that there are both business opportunities and simple solutions that can be sought here, I think it has to be a role for business to play in the future as well. Yes, absolutely. And if you look forward, say, five years, then what do you expect to see in this area? And, and, and how, how could it make a difference in those sort of five years? Well, certainly on a loss and damage um, perspective, you know, we unfortunately, under the UNFCCC, things don't tend to happen over night you know they take quite some time to set up and you know as you said people are very keen to make sure that money is spent well with the right systems and processes in place that takes time and so i'd like to think that in five years time that resources are being distributed at a healthy scale that some of the solutions that we've been talking about are really helping communities around the world but it's unlikely to be much faster than that quite honestly so i think five years time we'd be seeing this starting to reach a type of scale that would, would be useful I think what's also beginning to be acknowledged is that we've set target for reducing emissions and many countries set those targets. You know, people will have heard of NDCs or nationally determined contributions. What we don't have at the moment are targets to help protect people from the impacts of climate change. And I think what's uh, going to be discussed in Dubai is setting targets for that as well. So we're calling a global goal on adaptation. And so we may well see different countries around the world really pulling together much more around achieving a step change in the resilience to climate change. Because quite honestly, there is a growing realisation that the costs of the impacts now are getting very significant and that a relatively modest investment in resilience can actually make a really big difference to that economic loss. And I would extend exactly the same to businesses. I think we're seeing now around the world that many industries are acknowledging that they do need to take action now to protect their their own operations, their own workforce, and so on. And we're seeing many more businesses coming around the table and saying, how do we cooperate together and with government in order to protect ourselves at the same time as decarbonizing our businesses too? So I think in five years' time, we'll see much more cooperation around that. And that's more out of necessity, quite honestly, rather than things. But that's a good driver. Necessity is a good driver of, of business action. I think I would also would love to see, and you know, this is, is tough for many businesses, if they have had a history of emitting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere kind of become part of the problem, then actually there does need to be a stepping up of those businesses in terms of their responsibility to act in solidarity, including in 
in, in, in order to be able to help protect the people that have that have effectively been harmed by their their profits. You know, and, and I know this is something that's politically sensitive and can be quite tough to swallow, but this is coming. And it's it's just a simply an acknowledgement that if you've done harm, step up to the plate, do something good um, to help, even if it's just your workforce protect themselves. But I would encourage I would imagine that we're in having much more of those discussions by that time as well. Yes, I think these are new issues for many businesses to get their heads around. Um, and one of the things that strikes me in just looking at what we're seeing at the moment in Europe and North America with uh, heat waves, and I remember a few months ago, we had a forecast of that there was a 60% chance we'd hit 1.5 degrees in the next three years. It looks as if it might very well be this year at the rate we're going. But do you see that having a big psychological impact and maybe pushing forward a willingness to act on climate change if that indeed does happen? Well, there's been a history, quite honestly, of when a country gets hit by a very significant event, you know, a really significant shock. It can, in some ways, shock the system into some other pattern. And I think we are seeing more and more of those countries kind of hit by types of events and things that are really meaning that people step back and say, maybe we've not got the emphasis right, or, or we really do need to change our patterns of, of behaviour. And so I do see there being tipping points like that. I don't necessarily think that happens on a global scale. I think it happens probably community by community and country by country as they begin to experience those types of things. But equally, you know, 1.5 degrees is a global average calculation. What we're seeing now in different parts of the world is that there are different parts of the world warming much faster than 1.5 degrees and experiencing extremes that are much, you know, far beyond what has been experienced to date. So 1.5 degrees is in some way, yes, a psychological target set by an international community, but the experiences of climate change on the ground can be really quite dramatically different to that. And this summer, we're, ex- we're seeing that. El Nino has helping to exacerbate that, but scientists have been extremely surprised by sea surface temperatures that are off the scale compared to historical measurements. And so there is also a danger that we're starting to see some feedback loops that may not have even been very well predicted by the science, where we're, we're, you know, we're starting to experience what that's like, and, and the, the predictions are that we're going to see more of that and possibly more dramatic and but we're into a phase now where we may not be able to predict everything and that there are these feedback loops that we're we're beginning to experience so i think with that yes 1.5 degrees is a really important target to keep hold of it drives ambition and uh, sets a global goal but each country in the world is going to have to step forward and acknowledge a very different approach to protecting itself its people its businesses and that's a that's an effort that's going to require us all pulling together and, and acknowledging that we're in a different world and we require a different approach. But if we get that right, there are good signs that you can actually do a lot to protect yourselves and in ways which is not enormously expensive, but it does require much better cooperation and some investment. Well, Tom, I, I think that's an excellent point to to leave it on that slightly upbeat note. I think we can all see the, uh, the challenges are, are growing, but perhaps we're also learning how to cope with them better. So many thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Clinker Factor podcast today. If you've enjoyed it, do subscribe and please recommend us to friends and colleagues and anyone else who you think would be interested in what's happening in the cement and concrete industry around the world. WCA is a not-for-profit company. Please visit our website to see the services that we offer.